What you'll see behind me now is our main aquaponic production greenhouse. This is a dome greenhouse uh, put out by Growing Spaces in Pagosa, uh, Pagosa Springs, Colorado. Very popular style of a greenhouse here. Because of the winds that we get, this can take the winds and deflect them. But it's also got five layers of insulation. So this is a polycarbonate material, five layers of polycarbonate. And uh, you can always look at your greenhouse and you'll find an exposed area to see that. So this gives us a high insulation value for our greenhouse. So we're not throwing a lot of energy into heating, into cooling this greenhouse. It's done pre predominantly from the glazing material. Um, a couple other properties you'll see here is there's a vent, the side vents and even the top vents. These are passive vents. They open passively without any electricity. And the way they work is the vent itself, the, the opener shaft, is filled with wax. As the conditions get hot in that greenhouse and even outside this greenhouse, that wax expands and it opens up the vent passively. At night when it cools, it condenses back and it's going to close my vents passively. So we're very tuned into energy use here as far as our food production and also our water conservation. So food, energy, and water is what we focus on. So in this greenhouse, what you're going to see is I'm going to show you the aquaponic system. Our aquaponic system was based off the designs from the University of the Virgin Islands. So this is about a 1 16th model of what you would see in St. Croix in the USVI. Um, Kentucky State has a similar system based off the same ratios. So that, what that teaches us is that our systems are scalable. The UVI system is scalable. I can scale up, I can scale down to any size. So you're going to see inside here, I work with tilapia. So we've got a two tank system, not a four tank system like a UVI system. Two tanks. I've got a baffled clarifier for settling solids. I've got a fine solids removal tank. Um, a water distribution tank which pushes water into three grow beds and then all the grow beds centralize their flow, their outflow into one main pipe, returns to my sump and the cycle starts again. So a couple main points there is there's one water pump pumping up to the fish tanks and everything else throughout the system is done through gravity. Um, the other thing you're going to see is that I do a lot of diverse crop mix. Um, what you're going to see may actually surprise you that I'm doing things like cucumbers and tomatoes, I'm doing okra, I'm doing blackberries, so I'm doing fruiting crops and aquaponic systems and not a lot of people do that. The reason I'm able to do that is because I have a very mature ecosystem. This system that you're about to see has been in operation about four and a half years, recycling the same water in all that time. Never was it drained and dumped and never did we do a major water change. So that water has been recycling and it's building up microbes, it's building up plant growth promoters and enzymes that are helping the nutrients go across the root hairs and developing stronger and bigger plants. I'm very resistant to disease. I may have systems in here that are hydroponics that I will see things like powdery mildews and even root rot, a, a pythium fungus. I'm seeing more resistant in my aquaponic system and pr predominantly that's because of the age and the maturity of the system. Um, just because you see me doing the fruiting crops, don't think that you can do this when you start a new system. The system has to acclimate um, and then it has to mature. So I would recommend early on in aquaponic systems to do leafy greens, do things like basil, um, culinary herbs, lettuces, short turnaround crops. Uh, but once you get some things established, some nutrients, um, I would say go ahead and try it. Um, I have found that my fruits are sweeter than conventional hydroponics or store-bought. So we do things like bricks testing of our crops because I do soil here, I do hydroponics here, and I do aquaponics here. We get to do comparison trials as well. So always do that. Uh, make sure you're telling the customer the truth. If my aquaponic food does not have high bricks readings, I'm not going to say that. But I know other growers that will. They'll say this has the highest bricks of any food. Make sure to validate that. Don't just say that that's the case. Um, and then inside the greenhouse, you may see other hydroponic systems in, in production, but really we're going to focus you on our aquaponic system um, because of the resource utilization, the conservation, the sustainability of what we do. Um, that's why we're on the map right now. That's why classes like this one are rising in popularity um, because we're using our resource to the fullest. But what you're looking at here is two 175-gallon uh, fish tanks. Um, I do run tilapia in my system. So I look back at what I'm growing. I'm growing as, oh, for the plants. I'm growing tomatoes and cucumbers and peppers. 74 degree water is really ideal for them. And so I want a fish that takes 74 degree water. So what are your options? Uh, we don't have a lot that adapt to tank culture well. 
and I like to grow food fish, so that's even narrowed my selection. Um, I'm growing tilapia because they're bulletproof, they're marketable, they grow fast, uh, they reproduce easy if I want that to happen, um, and they're just, they're just marketable. That's the main reason. We eat more tilapia than catfish in the U.S. Um, so tilapia, because they're bulletproof, are a good fish to use in aquaponic systems. I'm feeding these fish three times a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and I'm feeding them the amount of fish feed that they need to support three grow beds in aquaponic systems. I have about six square meters of grow bed space, so I need to feed roughly a pound to a pound and a half of fish feed every day. And if I do that, my fish stay healthy, they're in a good environment, my plants don't show nutrient deficiencies. Um, the water flow is very simple. I've got a sump that's my low spot in the whole system. In that sump is a heating coil. I've got an external hot water heater that I manage at 74 degrees. I can bring that hot water into a coil that uh, releases the heat into the biggest volume of water in my system in the sump. I've got a small aquarium pump that pumps up, distributes the water flow to two tanks. The tanks drain from the bottom. So they're nice and self-cleaning. Tilapia keep the tank really clean. The two drains from the bottom of the fish tanks come into a settling tank. Um, this is a clarifier would be the common name for this. It's a baffled clarifier just like you would see at Kentucky State. Water comes in the system. The water has to travel under the baffle before it exits. So that slows the water down, allows the solids to settle out to the bottom of a cone. And just like at Kentucky State, you've got a valve at the a pipe at the bottom of that cone. I've got a valve and I can flush off the solid waste every day. I know my students did this today, so I'm not gonna pull it. But when I turn the valve, I let it uh, run clean. So I flush off the solid waste. Once it runs clean, I close it. And then there's a lot you can do with this, this sludge. What we're doing with the sludge is I am breaking it down, what we call mineralization. I'm using aerobic microbes to take solid waste and dissolve it, mineralize it into liquid nutrients. So what I get out of here is a liquid slurry. It's a sludge. And I take my sludge and I put it into an aerobic septic system. So this is just a cone bottom tank that I put every bit of my sludge in daily. I open it up, I put my sludge in, and now I wanna add aeration. I want enough oxygen in there to let the microbes break down that solid waste, and I also need circulation in there so the solids don't settle to the bottom. So because it's a cone bottom tank, I've plumbed this with an airlift pump. So you've got an aerator here and an air hose at that riser point. So as the water is rising up a pipe, wants to rise up the pipe, I make it rise by jamming air in there and as the bubbles rise, they carry the water with it. So we get a circulation in the system. Nothing settles to the bottom and goes anaerobic. And then I get a lot of aeration in there to feed those bacteria. So these uh, aerobic bacteria break down the solid waste about once a week, I unplug my system. I let this settle. And I'll have about a half of this will be clear, dissolved nutrients and water. And I siphon those off and I add them back to the sump of my aquaponic system. And that's one reason I get a lot more nutrients in my system than some people do in their aquaponic system. Because I'm returning anything that was discharged back to the system. So that made this a zero discharge system which if you're gonna get permitting for aquaculture, those are two key words, zero discharge, okay? So I remove large solids with the baffled clarifier. Fine solids, I have a secondary tank. Uh, we're making some refinement to this to make it a better filter. Right now, I have to siphon off the bottom every few days. Uh, we're gonna make a nice collection system to improve this. After solid waste is removed, the water comes through my next stage and is distributed to three grow beds. So these are three standpipes that uh, regulate the flow. If I need to isolate a grow bed, I just put a end cap here and cap that pipe and then two will operate while I work with one. Other uses for this sludge, if I don't want to break it down, return it to the system, I can put it into potted trees. It's a great fertilizer, very low uh, fertility. It's not going to burn my plants, 
but it's got long lasting fertility because it's still in the solid form. So this is a fig. I've got a lot of papaya trees. We use it um, on our compost pile as well. Uh, it's a valuable resource, so don't waste this. So after our solids are removed and I feed these three bed grow beds, water comes into every trough and water exits at the other end of the trough. So it's just three identical troughs my drains on the far end all join together and underground the pipe runs right back to my sump. So you've seen the entire loop of my system starting with the sump and I pump up one time and gravity does the rest. Gravity through the solids filters, gravity through the grow beds, gravity all the way back to the sump where it's pumped up one time. So again, you've heard before the golden rule in aquaponics is one water pump. Um, so try to design your system this way. It's also designed in a manner that if I, lose any, if I lose power here, my pump stops working, nothing overflows. So everywhere through this system is standpipes that regulate the water level. So any of these components will just maintain their water level in the case of a power outage. That's very important as well. Um, and then with the plant beds, uh, we'll go through and show you different types of plants that we're growing. But what I teach is diversity. I'm showing my students and the community here that we can grow just about everything. Um, I've got blackberries in the back, I've got okra, I've got tomatoes right in there with cilantro and celery and broccolis in here. Um, these nice cucumbers and tomatoes, I mentioned earlier, a lot of people can't do this because of the nutrients. Um, we go through here every day. Um, it's a lot of management as you could probably imagine. Pruning cucumbers, pruning off the suckers, and what we call leaning and lowering of these crops. As you can see, each crop has what we call a tomahawk. It's a spool of thread of line here that helps me uh, control this plant. I don't let any suckers come on here. I control it with one main line. I pick off my tendrils so they don't grab the next line. So I'm trying to keep these very organized. And once they grow over my main wire, I can lower them, that's why there's a spool. So we call it leaning and lowering. I'll lower this plant and then I can lean it over. If you can imagine these vines here, this is only about a, uh, I'd say this is about a six week plant. Starting to give me some nice fruit. These are the long English cucumbers. But in six weeks, it's grown 10 foot tall, eight foot tall. Once it reaches above that line, I'm gonna lower it down. So at, if you came back or you saw this facility in six months, I would have vines that run all the way to the end here and I curve them all the way back around and sometimes even back around again. But all you're gonna see is this grow tip with cucumber, 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 or tomato the same way. So this takes a lot of management, uh, but this is, this is the commodity. Everybody eats cucumbers, everybody eats tomatoes. Um, again, I focus my students on diversity they have to decide, can they make money at this? So now it's all about business, business, business. If you're at Kentucky State, Dr. Descupta is going to teach you about business, business, business. He taught me once that he said, he asked the crowd, he said, who likes to play with fish and plants? And of course, we all raise our hands. I love to play with fish and plants. Uh, Dr. Descupta put it another way. He said he likes to play with money. So if you want to play with money, you want to have a living in your career, you need to focus on money. So you need to figure out, yeah, this can grow, but can I make money at this? Um, one way I look at this is the more foodborne illnesses we have and food outbreaks, uh, food safety outbreaks with things like cucumbers, cantaloupes, lettuce was a recent one. We take that to our advantage. I told my students after we had a recent lettuce outbreak, I said, if you had lettuce today in Santa Fe, a local product, you could have just doubled the cost or the price that you would have got for your lettuce because people don't trust the safety of what's in the supermarket right now. Um, so you have to use all those advantages and you have to do your own uh, marketing. Uh, but again, something like a cucumber, I keep in here about five months. A tomato, I can grow about 10 months. You're not gonna see a lot of the beginning from this footage, but I've got a tomato in the back of my trough that's grown up to the top of the greenhouse. It, there's a main wire here, it's growing all the way here and it's still pumping out food 10 months later. Um, and this is an heirloom variety. I did not expect it to do so well. But that plant is easily 10 months old and has probably given me close to 100 pounds of tomatoes off of one tomato bush. 
Sounds impressive, but can you make money at it? Right now in my market, I can go to the grocery store and get certified organic tomatoes for $1.49 a pound. That's t this is tomato season. So uh, you need to think about when you grow and niche cropping. Um, so if we go back, uh, we're gonna go to the other side of this grow bed. The reason you see these vines on one end, this is the north side of my greenhouse. If I put them on the south side of the trough, they're gonna block all the sunlight. So these are all on the north side of my greenhouse. And as we get another video shot, you're gonna see my shorter term crops are over on the south side of the greenhouse, mainly for sunlight purposes. Okay, so you can see where I was talking about short-term crops up here near the south side. This is where all my sunlight comes. I'm not gonna block it with these vining crops. So I do a lot of short-term crops. Um, lettuce, again, a perfect marriage with aquaponics. Uh, a couple reasons, it's a perfect nutrient profile for a crop like lettuce, but also every restaurant needs lettuce. Every consumer eats lettuce. So there's a huge demand for lettuce. When we have food safety scares, you've got the fresh lettuce. You've got the food safe lettuce as well. Um, I do things like pak choy. So a lot of this is pak choy in here. Um, as a farmer, I found the value of pak choy just wasn't there. The, uh, the supermarket I sold to wanted three units bagged together and they would give me the same price as one unit of lettuce. Um, so you gotta look at your economics, but it does really well. Um, another crop I grow a lot now is red vein sorrel. This is a very pretty crop. So chefs are asking me to grow this because one reason, they can't buy this from their supplier. So if you go to a conventional Cisco or a food distribution uh, company, they're not gonna have these unique crops that have beautiful colors. So the restaurants like a, bit, a little bit smaller uh, sorrel. They like something like this, maybe a little bit bigger, and they mix this fresh in their salads and it gives it that pop, it gives it that zing that a consumer would be like, oh, that is a gorgeous salad. Um, and so this is cut and come again. I cut these bunches about once a week and next week I come back and do it again. So they're gonna keep coming for me. Um, as I said before, I teach diversity. So we grow a lot of crops in here. Um, Charles is gonna show you the different crops, um, but I look at something like this. My students wanna do flowers. Um, if you're a horticulturist, you should probably know that's a sunflower. If you look at the space that this sunflower takes, it's blocked out all the sunlight for my plants below. So maybe I'm gonna make a few dollars on a sunflower but if I really look well under here, I've got a lot of spindly lettuce plants. They did not get enough light. So as soon as these, uh, these start to flower, I'll harvest these, and I probably won't do lettuce, uh, sunflowers in here again with my students. But I do want to show them that we can do it. It's just, is it economical? Um, something like fennel would be the same thing. Um, fennel's a beautiful crop. Um, this is a bulb of fennel here, and this is going to get bigger and bigger. A typical bulb of fennel would be maybe about like this, and I would harvest this plant, and in the market I may get $3 from this plant. You may find some stuff on the internet with a, a there's a photo of me with a fennel that's probably this big, and the fronds probably spread this big. So it really took my space again. I don't have the space to grow the crops that I want because of the sunlight. Um, so again, we can grow it, but can we make money at it? I do like to grow things like kale. Um, this is a dinosaur kale where I can come through once a week, uh, just like I've been showing with the other crops, pick the big leaves off, um, just like your collard greens, and this will keep growing. So I can come through weekly and get a lot of kale. I sell kale for about $9 a pound. Uh, so it's a good money maker and it just keeps giving. I don't have to seed and transplant weekly. This crop can probably last me four or five, six months if I do things right. Um, then in here, all kinds of things. Thyme, thyme is a nice valuable culinary herb but it grows extremely slow in aquaponic systems. I'm showing that we can do it, and my students will get practice. I may have a group of students do yield on time, and they're gonna be very disappointed. Um, stevia, your natural sweetener. So if you got a market for this, maybe you have a lot of diabetics in your family or your community, look at things like the natural sweeteners. So we do focus on uh, medical herbs, uh, different medicinal herbs. A lot of my students wanna work in the cannabis industry. In New Mexico, that's legal. Colorado, it's legal. Arizona, it's legal. Um, so there's a lot of jobs for them. So we teach tomatoes, uh, but we're really teaching how to grow cannabis. It's the same as any other plant with the same requirements. Um, you just have different nutrient dynamics to think about. And so we can do that, but there are modifications needed to do good cannabis. Um, again, as I mentioned with the RAF system, 
I can look at my roots. I can come in here and see which ones do well, which ones don't like water culture. Um, so something like the sorrel, these are very old plants that have been in here a year of cut and come again. And uh, the roots themselves look a little brown, but they're still healthy. I'm not seeing pythium. Pythium's like a mushy root. These are just colored roots. So everything looks pretty good in here. So about four years ago, we put plecos in under the raft beds here. And now when I clean out the raft beds, my plecostomus are literally this big. And in a sense, they're edible. Many cultures eat a plecostomus. These are edible size already. What they're doing for me is they're detritivores. So they're going around the bottom and they're keeping anything in suspension. So solid waste that may settle in the bottom of my grow beds, the plecos will kick it up, put it in suspension. It'll make this way back over my standpipe, back through my filtration system so I can capture them. Um, again, there's lots going on here. Um, you're gonna get some visuals. You'll see things like some lettuce needs to be harvested. Um, I've been away, so I'm gonna get on that tomorrow. Mint is a great crop for cut and come again. I know a lot of you in Kentucky have a market for mint, for mint juleps and such. A lot of people grow mint, but what about the middle of the winter? A lot of people are not growing their mint anymore. So I've got a demand. I could sell 90 pounds of mint a week here in Santa Fe. That's a moneymaker for one of my students because it's really maintenance free. Um, again, a lot of crops to look at. Um, probably the berry is the one that I'm really um, putting a lot of attention to right now. Um, the blackberry in particular, I've also done raspberries in here because this is an indigenous crop here in Santa Fe. I work with a lot of First Nation tribal groups and they want to put their native foods back into production. When you go into their pueblos, the land's barren, the land's dead. They have to build the soil back, but they want to set up aquaponic systems to be nurseries for plants like this so they can get them back into their communities. So this is similar to my other mineralization tank. Um, I'm adding the sludge here every day. There's an airlift pump moving up, circulating that water through the system to keep it in suspension and aerated. And again, about once a week, I'll pull the plug, let this settle down, and add these nutrients back to my system. Um, we did a really amazing research project where I took the clear supernatant off and I ran a hydroponic system, buying no other fertilizers, only using fish waste, and we got commercial yields of cucumbers. So this is a valuable resource. Um, as fish farmers, you guys paid for this. You paid for the ingredients in your fish feed, so don't waste it. Uh, make sure you're taking advantage of everything that uh, can be offered from that initial fish food. So I take fish food, I get protein from my fish, the liquid uh, metabolites from the fish are feeding my grow beds. The solid slurry, I'm breaking down, adding it back and getting more food. So take advantage of that fish feed, do as many steps as possible to get the most out of it. And here at the college, we're also starting to work with algae as an ingredient in a fish food. So we know that we can produce algae here, very basic uh, nutrient inputs. Can I take that spirulina high in omega-3 oils, add it as an ingredient to a fish feed, and can I improve the quality of my fish protein um, in, with a fish like tilapia? Typically an inverted omega-6 to omega-3 ratio uh, because of the corn and soybean that they're eating. If I can add more fish uh, algae meal into the diets, I can turn that ratio around and make tilapia healthy fish. And that's one of our goals here.